Yeah, as you noted, we so in 2007, uh, we sold Brightside to Dolby Labs, which really means in 2006, we made the decision to do so, right? Because it, it took six months or so to complete the, the closing of the transaction. But in, in the middle of 2006, we were essentially deciding it's time to sell uh, and, and Dolby in parallel decided it's time to buy. Um, and um, I'll, I'll come to why Dolby bought us in a second, but why Brightside sold, it's basically that we were at a classic transition point in the business um, where, uh, well, basically where exits happen. So when you build a startup, the startup goes to kind of different stages of, of growth, just like a child goes through different stages. Um, and um, at each stage, you sort of have to ask yourself, okay, so we were, we were good at the stage that we just went through by definition, otherwise we wouldn't have gotten to it. Are, you know, are we also in the best configuration to go to the next stage and the best configuration in terms of the team, the money, the circumstances and so forth. And so the transition that we had come up to was the, the, the classical tech company transition between having demonstrated and developed the technology versus having demonstrated and developed a business. And we were right at that line. So we had, we had spent the first few years of, of the startup, um, you know, uh, coming up with the concept of local dimming LED TV of high down range displays. We had built prototypes. We had worked with a number of the big OEMs to um, build uh, reference designs. So we built reference designs with some of the big TV makers to show that this can be built into televisions, to show that this could be built into mass production devices. We had sold, uh, you know, we had revenue, we had sold a bunch of units, uh, but mainly it was sort of demonstration sales, right? So we would sell like two or three displays into the medical research space where people used it for radiology and to demonstrate it could be valuable there. And then we had sold some into the video post-production space where people demonstrated that this could be used to make movies basically and, and so forth. But um, so we had demonstrated that the technology works. We had demonstrated that it's valuable in multiple markets. And, and so the next thing for us would have been to actually uh, commercialize it in a real scale in those markets. And so to commercialize it in those markets, that means uh, you have to manufacture large volumes of displays you have to have the sales and distribution channels to distribute and, and service and provide those kind of displays, right? Um, and, and you have to have the organizational strength to support all that, right? The headcount, the funding, the, the factory space, the warehouse, all that kind of stuff. And at that time, and probably still too true today, um, it was pretty hopeless for a startup in Canada to manufacture consumer electronics devices at scale, right? It just like million things didn't work out. Like you even like back then you were doing that in Korea or Japan. Uh, it was moving to China at the time, Taiwan, right? But you definitely didn't do it in Vancouver, Canada, right? And um, nor did we have any expertise in that. Like we had expertise making the technology work. We didn't have expertise in manufacturing and operating factories and all this kind of stuff. So we had to, we would have to, if we wanted to have gone that route, we would have to really, really change the entire company. Uh, mm -hmm. So then that seemed really hopeless. So, so then the next strategic choice was, okay, well, if we don't want to do all that stuff, but if we still want to become a standalone company, then we could license our technology to somebody who does that, right? We could go to Samsung and LG and all the other ones and say, you get a license to our technology and then you do all that building and selling and doing and uh, you know, we get the money. Um, and we actually, we actually pursued that model. We actively engaged in that model. We partnered with a number of, of the big display companies. And the challenge with the licensing model is that it, um, that it basically has a delay, delayed payout. Uh, uh, the, the, the financial math is pushed back, right? Because let's say, um, I signed a licensing deal with Samsung today. So now Samsung has to develop a prototype, develop a design, do the design for manufacturing, bring it into production, bring it into the supply chain, start selling it, 
And then they probably only did that for like a pilot product line. Uh, and so that already took like a year and a half to two years, but they maybe only did it for a pilot line. So now they have to do the whole thing again for the mass production line. So it's gonna take two, three, four years before we would collect significant royalties um, and, and getting money back. And so the thinking was, what are we gonna do in the meantime, right? Like we're, we're, <laughs> what are we gonna do while we wait for all this? How are we gonna finance our life? How are we gonna do this, right? And that's when Dolby became an attractive partner because Dolby licenses technology to the big consumer electronics companies for a living. That's what they do, right? They have the organization for it. They have the financials for it. They have the patience for it, right? They have the ability to wait three, four, five years. Dolby is at the time was 40 something years old. Now it's 50, over 50 years old. They have the patience and the stability and the relationships and the force to do this. Uh, and so that's, that's when exit opportunities come, right? Because on, on the one hand, we had built a lot of value that for someone like Dolby was a really good platform to build on top to, you know, Dolby had a great business model. They really didn't have any video display technology. They had audio technology, but nothing in video or not really anything. Um, and so, you know, we could provide the technology, they could provide the business ability to bring that in the market and obviously also do more technical work and, and so forth, but really use that as a platform to build on. Uh, and so that platform was worth a lot of money to them. And for us, getting a lot of money now was better than getting, you know, the, that money or maybe even more money five years from now. Um, so that's why we sold and that's why they bought. Mm, that's a win-win solution, I think. And uh, it definitely is. Um, and it's, it's something that a lot of startups, and so that when I said earlier that this is a natural time for startups to sell, it's because you know, what I just explained is not just specific to Brightside, that happens very often in startups, right? They build really strong technical groups and then they come to that transition where they have to suddenly build a, a revenue business that scales, a manufacturing business, and then you know it, it's tough. It's also, by the way, where a lot of startups fail. A lot of good tech startups get to that level, then decide to become a production business, raise a hundred million dollars of venture capital, and then figure out that the production business is actually really hard, and it's a different skill set, right? The the person who was the CTO or the CEO to get from you know to the technology journey, maybe the wrong executive to go to the manufacturing journey different skill set, right? Um, and then, you know, they figure out three years later that they spent the hundred million dollars that they aren't manufacturing. And now they're going back to the buyers like Dolby and say, hey, please buy me. And Dolby says, yeah, sure, I'll buy you. I buy you at the exact same price as I would have bought you three years ago, except now you have, you know, a hundred million dollars of venture debt on your balance sheet. So we're very sorry that doesn't work anymore, right? That's how a lot of startups sort of take the wrong path. It, that doesn't mean that there aren't some startups that successfully take the manufacturing path, but especially in hardware manufacturing, that's really hard, really, really hard. And you work in AR, VR, you know, Omnivision is a big company, but uh, there's a graveyard full of startups that have tried to become VR headset manufacturing companies and then died basically, right? Like there's a, yeah, I mean, there's lots of those examples. Yeah, that costs uh, too much uh, for potential uh, investments beginning. Yeah. After you, uh, Dolby, you founded a company called Launch, uh, Launch, uh, Tandem Launch uh, Technologies to help uh, technology transfer uh, acceleration. And you bring, so what's the, that company and what are you doing in that company? So, so after, uh, after selling Brightside to Dolby, I spent uh, a few years at Dolby uh, building basically what is now Dolby's video uh, HDR business, um, at least the beginnings of it. Obviously now other people have moved that forward. And um, I, had, I had three epiphanies on what I wanted to do next. So epiphany number one is that I really enjoy building startups. So for sure, I wanted to go back into the startup world and I wanted to build companies. Um, insight number two was that um, there was a massively unmet demand in the big technology uh, industry, the big OEMs, the companies that Dolby was selling to or was licensing to for innovation, 
innovation has become the sole big differentiator for startups to survive, right? It used to be that manufacturing efficiency was the way you won. It used to be that, you know, access to raw resources or something. But these days, everybody manufactures in the same low cost countries. Anyhow, everybody, you know, has the same more or less efficiency. Everybody has the same access to global resources. And so, right, the only way you really differentiate yourself is innovation. And big companies typically aren't that good at innovation. They're great at doing that second stage of the journey, the manufacturing, the you know, all that. invention. You know, they, of course, they have R&D departments, but the sort of free scale innovation that you see at universities, that you see in startups is very hard for big companies to do. Um, and so there's a big demand for that. Uh, and there's a big supply for it, right? So I, I knew uh, in my own startup experience that we spun out a bright side from UBC, but in addition to our own invention and our own technical work, we struck partnerships with 11 universities that other universities, unrelated universities, that ended up collaborating with us and brought more invention, more ideas into our startups. So from that experience, I knew that there is a ton of great ideas in academia that, um, that is a sort of a supply chain, for lack of a better word, of, of innovation. So big industry wants innovation, academia has innovation. Why doesn't one go to the other? Because there's a gap. There's a gap because large companies um, need things to be realized to a certain level and academia can't really do that. Academia does the fundamental research, maybe builds a prototype, then the PhD student is done with her degree, moves off, it's done, the stuff goes in the shoebox on the shelf and that's it. Nobody ever hears from it, right? I could, you know, industry, on the other hand, needs something that you can give to a business executive who's supposed to write a check, who can press a button and go, oh, cool, this is awesome, right? And that gap in the middle is, is creating a barrier. So what we do at Tandem Launch is to build synthetic startups that close that gap. Uh, so here's how this goes. We have a network of industry partners, uh, many, many of the big technology companies. We work with them to identify big areas of opportunities, areas where there's big disruptive innovation possible, where they're looking for solutions um, and you know, where if there were a solution that would really change their business. We then turn around and we have hundreds of universities that we interact with and look at thousands of inventions on, on, at university campus each year and find potential solutions to those big problems. Once we have a solution, we uh, partner with the university, we pull the technology out of the university. We then assemble a team of entrepreneurial technologists, people like you that have aspirations to become founders of a startup, to become executives, leaders. Uh, we build teams with them. We add business executives, operational executives, all that other stuff. Uh, finance that whole thing. So we also have a venture capital fund. We, we invest a million dollars or so in each, in each venture. Uh, incubate it, nurture it, uh, and then basically it spins out from us as a real little company that then goes on and, and hopefully serves that big industry need either by building a product directly or by selling to or partnering with the, the big companies. Yeah, in, in our world, we call ourselves sometimes a foundry or a studio, but for, for startups, right? Like we, we really are, we are a turnkey builder of companies. So we, we find the problem, we find the, the technology solution, we find the people, we glue it all together, finance it, operate it. It's really like a fab, right? It's just that what goes in, the raw materials are people and idea and the output, you know, instead of semiconductors, it's little companies. What are the technologies that are nowadays for these startups that you town the launch have helped? Yeah, so we've uh, we've by now built a little bit over thirty companies in this format. Um, they cover uh, a number of domains. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the the simple answer is we do the kind of stuff that we understand technically mm -hmm. and business wise understand. But um, what that means is on the technical axis, it's technology in I would say physics, uh, computer science, electrical engineering, a lot of material science to your background, um, uh, sort of in that chemistry, in that technical world. And then in terms of applications, uh, we work in consumer electronics, uh, both hardware and software, but in the CE kind of universe, uh, and IoT, a bit of industrial IoT, 
a uh, bit of automotive because those are the, the, you know, there's a lot of intersection there, right? So basically if the Samsungs, the LGs, the, the Huawei's of the world are interested in that, that's typically what we do uh, mm -hmm. with those kind of technology foundations. So we've built companies um, that have done flexible electronics for displays like Omniply. We have built companies in robotics like um, uh, Suometry and Notus and drones in uh, a lot of AI, computer vision uh, companies like Merometrics or um, uh, Range. Uh, we've also done some more specialized markets. So for example, we've built a handful of computer vision companies in different kind of technology platforms. Uh, one of which is SportLogic, which is using uh, computer vision techniques for sports analytics. So that's, you know, from our perspective, it's a computer vision company, but from the market's perspective, it's a sports analytics company. So it's always the, it's the, you know, the tech and the market are two different axes, I guess, of that, uh, of that equation. Oh, uh, company is located in Monterey, in uh, Canada. So why did you pick up this place and not some <laughs> like Silicon oh. Valley or somewhere else? Yeah, like, like, like many things in my life, there's a degree of randomness to it. So my wife is from Montreal. Um, and uh, we, we had been together for about a decade on the West Coast. So I'd, I'd been in Vancouver and then down in Santa Clara uh, with, with Dolby and, 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 and so forth. And uh, for about a decade, uh, and my wife had always said that she one day wants to move back to Montreal. Um, and so eventually I ran out of reasons to stay on the West Coast because I I'd finished my PhD, sold my company, was done at Dolby, everything was sort of finished. And so, so short of starting like a medical school degree at UBC or something, I was I was out of reasons to stay at in the West Coast. So, so uh, she, she saw her window and said, we're moving to Montreal now. Whatever crazy stuff you do next year, that's fine, but you do it in Montreal. So that's how I ended up here. Um, uh, interestingly enough, like many random things, like coming to UBC was random and for the wrong reasons, worked out well for me. Same for Montreal. So as it happens, uh, I, I moved here in 2009, late 2009, early 2010. Um, and a few pieces of magic happened. So I mentioned earlier that we're building a lot of companies in the computer vision AI space. Uh, that's mainly because towards the end of my journey at, well, Dolby and Brightside, we were more and more looking at computational displays and computational techniques. And so I was co personally getting more and more interested in computer vision um, and, uh, the, um, and my PhD as well, which was still uh, finished in 2009. So right in that period. Uh, and so we started building companies in that space. And then two lucky things happened. One, the whole AI space became hot, which in, in 2009, nobody could have predicted that this would become this huge thing. But you know, a few years later, when we had built the few, first few computer vision companies, it became really a hot space. So that worked out well for us. Um, and then uh, second, Montreal, just by complete dumb luck, happens to be one of the epicenters of the whole machine learning AI uh, thing. Uh, by 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 more or less dumb luck. So the three the three researchers who you know many decades ago developed sort of the foundation for what we what we today call machine learning. Um, um, uh, one of them settled in Montreal. Uh, one of them settled. Uh, Jeff Hinton settled in Toronto. Joshua Bengio in Montreal, and Jan Lacoon in, in New York. Uh, the other two ended up very quickly getting essentially acquired by Facebook and Google and worked directly in those little niches. Um, whereas the third one here in Montreal, Joshua, um, stayed an independent agent and built this massive AI group uh, before it became popular. And then when it became popular, suddenly Montreal has all this crazy amount of talent in that space. Uh, so I'm, I'm very grateful that my wife pulled me here, but it is, it is a bit of a coincidence. Th that said, Montreal is a wonderful city to live. Uh, very chill, very easygoing. Money goes a long way, low cost of living. So I, I, I love living here, but uh, the, the, the reason for arriving is about as random as it gets. If any uh, researchers uh, or technologists want to uh, uh, join uh, Tandem Lounge and uh, build the technology companies uh, with you, so they have to move to uh, Monterey. Yes, so we're assembling all the teams here. Um, uh, there's now well over a thousand people in Montreal that are working in tunnel launch companies. Um, the, um, they come from all over the world. I would say, uh, obviously these days with COVID and travel, it's a bit more difficult, but, but uh, historically they've come from 40, 50 different countries. 
Um, and uh, because we really, um, we, have, we have no filter other than quality, right? So uh, because we built the team synthetically, right? They, they don't have to know each other beforehand. In fact, they never do. Um, they don't have to have worked on the technology. So we, we, when we find a technology, let's say at Stanford, that doesn't mean that the inventors of that technology need to be on the project, right? We can find somebody else. So for example, at, at Omniply, which is our flexible display company, um, the technology does come out of Stanford and Purdue University. Uh, the, um, the, the material science founder, uh, Yumaira, who is actually also actively involved with SID, is, uh, uh, she's originally from, from uh, Bangladesh, but uh, she did her PhD at, at Berkeley, unrelated to Stanford and the same city, I guess, but unrelated. Um, the, um, uh, the CEO, Harit, who is uh, SID's uh, convention chair, um, uh, you know, he's in the Bay Area. Uh, Kareem, the operational co-founder, he's from Toronto, Ontario, I guess. Um, uh, France, uh, the, you know, like, and suppose I can go through the whole team, like they're all from all over the place, they didn't know each other and we glued them together. Um, the, um, and so we are sort of this like melting pot for smart, talented people. Uh, and you know, they go off and build companies and have hopefully the same success that, that I enjoyed or even bigger, which is, would be awesome. If uh, any researchers want to start up a company, What's your suggestions to them? In general, if you are a university researcher and uh, mm -hmm. you have something that, you know, your research or your project is interesting and you want to build a startup around it, um, the best advice I can give is uh, work very quickly to surround yourself with good people. Startups, um, you, know, you know, there's this saying that you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Um, uh, I think that's true for human beings in general, but it's very much true for startups. The, the, you know, the, the, the people that work on a startup utterly define what it becomes. And whether that's the founders who are in the company or the board of directors or the main investors, but that, that small group of people that drives the story of a startup, they will set the culture, they will set the success, they will set the technology, they will set everything. And you want to reach high. Uh, one of the mistakes I see a lot of young entrepreneurs make is they, they want to start a startup. They don't know what to do. So they find like their friend from school and then, you know, maybe their cousin and maybe two other people that basically look like them. Um, and that's really a bad idea. Like you want to reach high. You want to find the best person in the world that works in your field and see, please, 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 you know, work with me. And then you want to find really successful business entrepreneurs, executives, investors, and you may not get all of them, right? But you want to aim high and you don't want to settle down because that, that will define where your startup is going to end up. I had the privilege over my career uh, to work with exceptional people that many of whom I work with still today in new ventures and new startups. Uh, and that like created an uplift for me that is tremendous. Uh, and, and so part of why I do tunnel launches is to provide something similar for, for first-time entrepreneurs now, because I think it's, it's an incredible, powerful leverage mechanic. I got um, involved in SID on the, on the program committee for Display Week in 2004. Um, I, as a member before that, but, but in 2004, I joined the program committee on invitation um, of, a, of a gentleman called Lou Silverstein, who was a fixture in the um, uh, perception, display imaging, a uh, cognitive kind of space, uh, color imaging, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I had started working with him. Uh, he was one of those collaborators that at Brightside very early on, I'd identified, I'd reached out to build a relationship and said, hey Lou, we should work together on some projects. And he was a, a, a fixture. He was one of the, the, the elder statesmen of that space at the time. And so he was such a gentleman and he started working with me and then he said, you know what, I'm, I'm at this thing called SID in the program committee. You should really join us on the program committee, in the applied vision subcommittee. And I said, well, I'm an undergrad student. So what the hell, you know, what, what, you know like everybody else there is like a full professor and, and like experts in their field. What am I supposed to do? Right. And he said, you know what, you're working on something really interesting. You're a smart guy. Come to the, come to the program committee and uh, I'm sure you can be useful. And I realized at that time, well, first of all, 
that was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, many of the then members of the Applied Vision Subcommittees are still friends and collaborators. And to this day, I made some great relationships at the time. Um, and I realized that while I did not have the same academic credentials, I mean, not even close, right? They were, <laughs> most of these people weren't even teaching people like me, right? They were teaching grad students who were then teaching people like me, right? So, so um, right, nowhere close. So I decided early on, I'm gonna pay my dues, um, not just to technical contributions, I, I did make some technical contributions, but not just to that, but also to what I actually knew how to do, which is I could work hard, I could do stuff, I could help, I could organize. And later I understood business, right? So I could help on the business side. And so much of my career as a volunteer at SID follows that track. So. 2004, I joined the program committee. 2005, I became the chair of the Applied Vision Committee, not because I was the smartest or most educated person on that group, not at all, but because I put in the time to organize stuff, because I put in the time to read all the papers beforehand and allocate them to the right people and organize them and brought it onto an online platform and so forth. And that theme kept happening, right? So I became publication chair, not because I was really good at publishing, right? I'm not an edit academic editor, but because it was costing us $800,000 a year for SID in the publication branch. And I renegotiated a whole bunch of contracts, business I know how to do, right? To bring it down to less than $100,000 a year. I was able to make operational improvements. I changed the structure to have a new role of editor in chief that has a three year term because I wanted to have a rotation and turnover. One of the big problems of SID at the time was that every position was filled by somebody who then held it for like 30 years. And so there was really no place for young people to enter the society, right? So I created term limits all across. And I later, as secretary and treasurer of the board, uh, led a governance reform, which created term limits and rollover and re reconfigured the boards, right? So it used to be that as a director, you could stay a director forever. So we had directors who had been directors for like 100 years, not uh, quite, but like 20 years, 30 years, right? And so now we have a term limit system and you can only become a director for a two, two, two years and then one extension to four years, right? And so that has allowed young people to come in, that has allowed women to come in, other minorities to come in, right? And so in the beginning, a lot of this was work I did uh, to kind of prove why I should be there, right? Make my contribution. Towards the end of the journey, I made my contribution. It became creating opportunities for the next generation to follow. And the, the YES program is part of this, right? Uh, Tree Karavemba, who was a champion of a lot of these things, um, was one of my co-conspirators, for lack of a better word, in the SID leadership to create new things, you know, uh, bring into being the Women in Tech Initiative, uh, the YES Initiative, bring into being uh, the sort of funnel of uh, reconfigure the Bay Area chapter where, where Tree was very actively as the regional VP involved in rejuvenating the leadership, rejuvenating the membership, right? And I think that's uh, a tremendous opportunity. So SID is a phenomenal opportunity for early career individuals to really expand their network towards incredibly talented people. And then as you grow, it's an opportunity to give back and be that person that opens the door for the next generation to add value to SID, but also to add value to their life and their career. If you're if you're strong technologist interested in entrepreneurship, give us a call. If you're an inventor with a technology that you think has commercial potential, give us a call. If you're you know less likely, but if you're an investor that wants to invest in those companies, also give us a call. Um, you know we are really at the nexus of all these sort of ingredients that we cook together into a wonderful meal. Um, but but also don't hesitate to reach out to me if you're interested in volunteering at SID. Um, I've uh, coached and mentors a whole bunch of uh, young entrepreneurs or young SID volunteers uh, through their journey into the SID organization. Or, or if you have a startup that has nothing to do whatsoever with Tandem Launch, doesn't want anything to do with Tandem Launch, but you would like some advice on, on your startup or your technology, just you know, send me an email and I'll see what I can do. Always happy to chat to passionate people. This is all for uh, today's uh, interview. Uh, see you next time. Thank you very much, both of you. It's been a pleasure and see you at the show next year.